Welcome to today's webinar. Uh, this one is, uh, I call it canola, my biology and life in pictures, but uh, that's just a trick to get you here because I'm going to first, uh, the first half hour, I'm going to talk about some basic principles of growing crops that I want to cover. And you can see from my cover page here that it's uh, getting to be springtime and looking forward to the bugs here. You can see birthers are coming and the parasitoids are coming and the diseases of bugs are coming. This is a Saskatchewan bertha that got affected by uh, by fungi I found one night when I was in Saskatchewan and then very shortly the, the flea beetles are coming so through the season we'll be covering off some of these as well as agronomic things as we go but today we're going to be talking about uh, about canola and I'm going to do a little introduction something about nutrition uh, nutrient considerations and damage from nutrients roots staging to germination vegetation pollination reproduction and then to keep you in suspense, I'm going to end up with uh, a bit on club root and some of the stuff I've been doing with club root and what Taurus is thinking relative to uh, utilization of sulfur plus to manage club root problems. So first of all, though, I'm going to talk about some things in principle. And I use this slide a, a, a lot because here we, we see that a plant is not a complex organism in one sense. It takes nutrients in, in solution from roots, moves it up the xylem into the leaf, runs it through the chloroplasts and gets a little bit of sunshine, gives us oxygen and produces sugar. Then it takes that sugar and it runs it up into uh, the sinks, which is the new growth and to the roots because roots can't feed themselves. Now, the coolest thing about this all is if you think about it for just a second, all this plant gets are nutrients from the soil, sunshine from the air, or from the sun, I, I mean, and water. And from those ingredients, it makes through biosynthesis within the cells everything it needs and provides a homeostatic situation in all its cells. That is a miracle that it can do all that, and it does it based on its genetic blueprints and i'm going to talk a little bit about genes because uh you know everybody thinks genes up regulate and down regulate you know genes can't do nothing they just sit there they're just blueprints and i'm going to talk a little bit about some of the stuff i've done in earlier webinars and and for folks that um, that haven't followed me uh, you should be uh, reviewing my webinar on the cell and uh, my webinar on stress management because i can't cover everything in in one presentation here and those are forerunners to this, so you, you'd understand this uh, a little bit better. So we're going to take a close look. And that is all controlled by water. Water leaving through the uh, guard cells in the stomata, through the stomata, puts suction on the root system, and that keeps the system going. Now, the trick is, is as long as that's going, the plant can bring in nutrients, it can cool itself, it can pressurize its flow so it can move nutrients up and down in the plant but when that stops when the stomata close we have immediate stress and that occurs due to all kinds of things in fact if you take a look at this slide and, and I, I think i borrowed this from phil thomas who used this a lot you have all of these factors that are influencing whether you're going to get a crop and how that crop is going to do and from from the soil conditions to phs to frost free days to humidity to periods of stress on the plant and you know what in spite of all of these things the plant is going to do its best across the landscape every plant based on its own genetics which is common because these are all pure pure genetic uh, lines and they will all up and down regulate as we talk about genes but they will do different things. Each plant, depending on where it's living, what it's exposed to, will do different things. And it will do the different things throughout its life as it comes from germination through to pollination at this point in time. It'll be growing a lot of biomass and pulling a lot of nutrients. When it hits pollination time, suddenly hormonally, things will change. So will uh, sunlight, the, the photo period will also change. And at that point in time, the plant then focuses on filling that seed. And we grow annual crops here, which are typically called monocarpic crops. In other words, they will, uh, from a seed, germinate, produce a crop in the same year and then die off. So those crops 
uh, because of the short growing season that we have in, in the prairies of Western Canada. Uh, well, well, have to have programmed into them death, and that's called programmed cell death. So as, as we move past the reproduction, the plant will start pulling nutrients from its lower leaves. And particularly with canola, we see that as canola is, is getting up and past that match, uh, uh, reproductive period in bloom, the bottom leaves will yellow and everybody says, well, they should be staying green. Well, you know, by that time, the, those leaves are old. Uh, they're also being shaded a lot, so they're not photosynthesizing. And the plant will pull the nutrients out of there by lysing all those cells and take everything it can, especially the, the mobile nutrients and move them up to the seed. That's the way all plants basically perform here in, in, in our short growing season, except for perennials. So now this is gonna get complicated uh, for some of you guys that haven't been in university for a little while or maybe never were exposed to this, but I'm gonna try and make this fairly simple. Here's the typical cell, and, and there's a good reason why I'm, I'm gonna talk about this. And in the cell, there's this vacuole thing, which is a, like a big balloon with a cell membrane around it that can uh, transport nutrients in and out and toxic materials in and out, and it can take in excess of whatever and store it there. And we have the nucleus which we always said that was the brain of the plant. This is where all the DNA is, is the genes and the chromosomes are located on the DNA in the nucleus. And then there's other things here, the chloroplast where photosynthesis takes place, mitochondria, which uh, uh, produce energy during the daytime for plants and through the night, and a whole bunch of other things. And there's this little passage here called the plasma desmata, which connects uh, between cells. Now we'll move over to this diagram here. So the key things are, I wanna show you, here's the nucleus and there are entries to the nucleus and there's this thing here called the endoplasmic reticulum. You don't have to remember all this stuff, chloroplast. But the important thing is there's a little blue line. That's called the plasma membrane. And you can see that it ends here and actually plants can communicate between cells using this endoplasmic reticulum and move little pieces of RNA between plants and also plug it off so that if a virus is moving through a plant, it can try and stop it here. So this all goes on based on the genes. So let's look at that little blue line around the cell, the plasma membrane, and here it is. And you can see a couple of things that are really important. All these blue dots are phosphorus, called the phospholipid bilayer. So there's a bilayer of phosphorus, and in the middle are lipids or fats. So in fact, this is not permeable. If you look at, we can get a little bit of air through it, a little bit of alcohol, but we can't get any sugar through it. We can't get any of these ions uh, through it. We can't get amino acids through it. So because it is impermeable, what happens is the plant puts in all these sensors with little antenna and it's measuring everything in every cell, in the roots, in the anthers, in the pollen, wherever it is, it's got these antenna, and it's got little portals. So in fact, based on what it is sensing in its environment, it either opens or closes or makes more of these portals, which are transporters to move nutrients through the cell wall. So it is in fact the plasma membrane with these sensors that are the brains of the plant. That'll come in later. Now, during the process of growing, the plant needs two nutrients, in my opinion, and I mean, this is probably not based on any science, but just based on, on rational thinking. It needs to build the cell. To do that, it needs to build the DNA and the genetic material. What is that? Phosphorus. And these are all nitrogen compounds and nucleotides here that make all the DNA and the genetic material. So the plant will do whatever it has to to get nitrogen and large amounts and phosphorus. But let's take a look at what most plants actually take up. Nitrogen, as we said, big time. We're building all those amino acids out of the nitrogen, which in fact are linked together to form the proteins and the plant that puts in all those portals that I just showed you in the plasma membrane are proteins and the genes carry the blueprint to make all of those proteins. So if the plant needs more nitrogen, the sensors will tell it it's short of nitrogen. Messenger RNA will go to the genes, get some, uh, make a copy of that gene, 
and it will make more of those portals, whether they be in the roots or depending on what the situation is. Next, we have potassium in the largest volume, followed by calcium, magnesium, and phosphorus. Potassium is used mostly to move things around, but you can see that phosphorus is at the same level of sulfur. And we need the sulfur there because uh, the, the amino acids, there are roughly 20 that build proteins, two of them contain sulfur. The other thing we got to look at is what is controlling what is going in, and one of them is pH, and, and it's very important. If you take a look at pH, here's neutral, and you can see that most nutrients are fairly readily available at, at, at pH 7. And between 6.5 and 7.5, and and pretty well the same thing. But when you look at a large number, especially these micronutrients here, as you can see, as the pH goes up above 8, many of them become tougher to get. And if the pH goes down below 5.5 or 5, many of these become difficult to get as well. And some of these, like phosphorus, get tied up with iron, manganese, uh, in the soil, which becomes soluble, uh, of, say aluminum, becomes soluble and can tie them up. The exception here is, of course, molybdenum, and, and that's important because I'll talk a little bit about that more, is uh, as plants grow, and especially where we've gotten on till, we're, we slowly acidify uh, due to fertilization and just plants growing. Because when plants respire in the rooting zone, they give out CO2, which becomes carbonic acid, and the soil just becomes acid over time. In most places in the world, they apply limestone to control that. So as the pH goes down, molybdenum becomes tougher. As the pH goes up, things like copper and zinc become harder to get. And there's a place in here where boron becomes short, so does man do manganese and iron. And for those guys that grow canola, you know that you can get iron deficiency chlorosis in soybeans uh, at those higher pHs because it's uh, tough for the plant to, to extract it. But we're getting down to the nitty gritty here. And, and I always uh, go to this slide because we're looking, looking at canola because what the canola plant takes out in its seed to me is a really key indicator of what's important to the plant. And I, I've highlighted in red some of the ones that I think are important. I mean, we're, we're all using you know, nitrogen here and you can see soybeans use a lot of nitrogen here. And whenever you're, you're using a lot of nitrogen, you have to balance that out with the sulfur. And canola is high protein. Um, more so than wheat. So you can see that wheat doesn't have nearly as much nitrogen requirement uh, as, as canola, but most of that goes into the meal. But here's the key. Look at the phosphorus uptake. Pound and a half per bushel, and it takes off a little over a pound. Sulfur, we can see that it takes up much more sulfur than any of the other plants we grow, including peas, because of that protein content. And it's got a lot of sulfur compounds in it. Magnesium, also a fair amount compared to uh, some other plants, but nothing drastic. But look at this, copper. We always talk about copper as being a problem in, uh, in cereals. But in fact, on a per bushel, ba uh, bush, uh, bushel basis, the plant takes up more copper. Uh, as on a plant basis, sorry, not on a per bushel basis, takes up as much copper because copper is key in the electron transport system in the plant. And then take a look at boron you can see that canola is a big boron user and it also takes a lot into the seed. So if you've ever heard me speaking before, I've been telling you that if you're gonna look for a boron deficiency, it's gonna be canola and probably peas and other dicots, which are now called eudicots. Uh, the term dicot is sort of a past now. Uh, so eudicots use a lot more boron as a whole compared to cereals. And that's, that's fairly well documented. But take a look at this, iron. Takes up a lot of iron, much, much more, and removes a lot of iron. So I'm beginning to wonder if some of those parts of Saskatchewan at low, uh, high pHs uh, might not be squeaking a low on terms of iron down the road. So the plant has to take all those up, and the iron is used in electron transport, just like the copper is used in electron transport, and the zinc is used in, in the whole group of of uh, enzymes that are in plants. So they all have a purpose. And we also then have to take and we have to supply those nutrients throughout the growing season because the demand varies depending on where you are. And we'll just pop through these quickly. You can see that on emergence, you know, it uses a little bit of everything and mostly potassium because the potassium is used to move things. When we get to five leaf, which is when we start getting uh, the uh, 
flowers starting to form or the buds starting to form, look at the demand for nitrogen as we build those cells in the reproductive part and as well as the vegetative part. We're using a lot of energy at that point in time as well to build the DNA into there. And the potassium usage is monstrous during that time period. When we had 50% flower, things ease off a bit because they're flowering. And then as we move into the end of flowering and we start uh, building the pods, you can see that suddenly the phosphorus demand and the potassium demand go up in terms of filling those pods that have been produced. One of the dilemmas we face, and I'm really keen on potassium, is that potassium is frequently low when we do tissue tests once it goes into, into flowering. And that's I think, is uh, one big issue. Potassium is really critical to water management and also stress management in the plant. And whenever we get into a, a sort of later summer and it's dry, plants have a difficult time getting potassium because roots aren't growing and, and the actual clay particles trap it. And they also have difficulty getting phosphorus because phosphorus doesn't move uh, somewhat similar to potassium, but phosphorus is a lot more immobile in the soil. So the plants have to start extracting it from the lower leaves and that's what they do. So on that great big curve that uh, I showed you earlier, you know that I always say, you gotta load that plant before it goes into bloom. So, and that's what happens. We're loading these plants here as we move into the end of the season, loading them up. And then once we get into blossom and pod filling, basically we're pulling it out of the leaves and the stems. Now I wanna throw this in just, just to make a point. Uh, in 1986, we had six and a half million acres of canola on the prairies, and in 2015, we had 20 million, and we're holding about that level. And I want to show you something. If we had 20 million acres and we're producing 40 bushels of canola per acre, and we're taking a pound of phosphorus out per bushel, that's 800 million pounds of phosphorus per year, or 4, 400,000 tons tons of phosphorus per year are removed from the prairies in canola. And canola can extract phosphorus, in my opinion, as good or better than anything else, even they, though they have developed without mycorrhizae. And we look at potassium here. We have uptake, the yellow lines, uptake right through the season, and we have sulfur, huge demand of sulfur. So. I haven't talked about micronutrients, but when you look at the demand, the amount of nutrient we've been pulling out of the soil, including phosphorus and micronutrients, and micronutrients are mostly metals that are uh, sort of insoluble in a large sense. We've been farming this land now for about 110 to 20 years. We haven't been putting micronutrients back. We haven't even been putting back adequate amounts of NPK and S, which we talk about. So it's not surprising that we have some difficulties and deficiencies. And uh, one of them is, of course, I'm gonna talk a tiny bit about sulfur because sulfur is, is key uh, in terms of forming those two amino acids, cysteine and methionine. Now, when a plant takes up sulfate, which it takes up, it can't use it. It's like nitrate, a plant can't use it. It's gotta reduce it, reduce it. And in fact, a reduction of, of sulfate to sulfide before incorporation into the amino acid cysteine uh, takes a lot of energy, more than it does to convert nitrate uh, to ammonium. From that, the plant makes methionine. Now, the, the, the really cool thing about methionine is when a, when a protein is made by a plant in the ribosomes, uh, the start amino acid is methionine all the time. So if your plant is short of sulfur at any point in time that it's actually growing cells and making any uh, proteins, it's gonna suffer. So sulfur, and we've reduced the amount of sulfur coming out of our stacks and becoming an issue. I'm gonna talk a little bit about roots in a minute, and I just wanna point out a few things. If we look at salt index, which is sort of an indication of, of maybe some issues of toxicity to seeds and seedlings, we look at U, uh, UAN, it's pretty high. Ammonium sulfate's higher. Ammonium thiosulfate's a bit higher. And then we look at gypsum, and I just point out uh, sulfur plus is really low. So you can put a lot into the seed row without affecting any toxicity. These, you gotta be a lot more careful. Uh, when we look at the phosphorus products, I mean, we, we, we have uh, a less uh, of a salt index, but still substantial compared to crystal green. 
And if you uh, if you haven't noticed this, potassium chloride KCl, uh, wow, it uh, is a crystal, and it's something you want to watch for putting in for, um, uh, and most of you guys know that. Now we're going to switch to roots quickly, and then I'll get on to the the photograph showing you how the plant grows, uh, and I'll, I'll I'll show you some more of this as go. The typical root, uh, it's got a cap to, to protect it as it moves through the ground, but it's relatively unprotected. Here's the elongation zone here where the plant takes the cells that were born here in this meristem stomatic area right back here called the quiescent zone where these are the embryonic cells that make up new root. And then uh, to uh, extend the root through the soil, it uses a lot of potassium and water to pressurize the root cells and expand them, just like a hydraulic pump. And that always takes calcium and boron as well in, the, in terms of the cell walls. After that, we get root hairs coming on. So the plant is putting out all kinds of enzymes and products here at the root tip so that when the root moves through the ground, by the time it starts producing root hairs here, microbes in the soil are activating and releasing nutrients and all kinds of other compounds. And the root hairs pick up most of the nutrients and water. Then we get lateral roots put out a little further down the pipe. And you can see that here in, in a nice root where the cap is there and then the root hairs start forming and we get lateral roots forming here. Uh, this is uh, my classic photograph of root uh, lateral roots on a seven day old canola seedling, just putting out lateral roots into crystal green and melting the actual crystal green uh, gradual. So when we're, when we're farming and we're putting out a sideband, for example, you wonder, well, how does the plant actually find the sideband? Well, it probably picks up the nitrogen bloom or what is mobile. And then the plants in those sensors I talked about in the plasma membrane of the cells here in the, in the lateral roots uh, and some of the root hairs, a root hair is a single cell. So it still can do that. And then once it picks up there, it'll explode in terms of producing more roots and root hairs. And then once it gets into the xylem, it's all mixed up and up she goes in the plant. Lastly, I wanna just make another point. Uh, here's small and large seeds. Uh, now that we've got better segregation, at least some of the companies into seed by sizes, we're not getting as much and it makes it kind of nicer because it uh, has some implication from a toxicity point of view. Here's an example uh, for you guys that are in the field a lot and say agronomist, uh, you always want to carry a shovel with you. You know, if you've been at one of my field days, uh, I'm always digging up roots because that's where the secrets lie in terms of what that plant is going to do because plants feed in the soil largely. Before man came along, nobody was foliar feeding plants. Uh, it just didn't happen unless it came out of the air from volcanoes and sulfur and stuff like that, and lightning. But uh, here's what happens here. Yeah, I put a, a bunch of urea granules, as you can see, and I blew it up here. You can see that it just melts the root tips. But you know what? The plant didn't die. It'll put them out back here, whatever's alive and left. And you can see how this root actually picked up the urea, the nitrogen, and moved over there and it got toasted, but the rest of it was fine. Here's ammonium sulfate, the variant. So if you have this big crystal by this seed versus this one by this seed, you've got a difference. Urea, look at the difference in sizes. These are five or six years old map potassium chloride. So if you got a little seed and you got a little granule, it's not as toxic. You got a little seed and a big granule, it's got a greater risk. And sometimes in in furrow applications, it's just sheer luck as to where the granule of fertilizer falls relative to the seed and the seed size. So you can get some toxicity. So you want to watch out. You don't want to set the seed back uh, early on. Here's, for example, is, uh, just to, to demo a uh, potassium chloride. You can see what a granule of potassium chloride did placed by the seed. Just that simple. But the seed did not die. So when you're checking early on in the season, dig up the plants and look at the roots. Uh, this is uh, just some shots here showing uh, this is crystal green, the new formulation for 2020 showing root hairs growing in. And this is synchro which is gonna be a formulation that we're developing and when it's registered, it'll be available probably next year. Uh, again, just a shot of a typical root. And you can see in this case, these lateral roots burrow right into the crystal green, just like the granule. So the lateral roots will, will in fact explode 
and extract. You can see not very well, but on this side of the root, there's actually no root growth. So the plant, through those sensors that I talked about, is continually influencing the genes, or it's not influencing it, it's copying the genes, and it is in fact deciding where it's gonna put uh, lateral roots in the plant, where it's gonna put root hairs. That's genetically controlled and hormonally controlled. That's it. Now we're gonna get on to how a plant actually, a canola plant actually grows. And, and uh, for guys that have followed me, you know that I usually use BBCH, it's more of a European system, similar to Zadox here in North America. And, uh, uh, and I like to use it uh, uh, because it sort of covers all plants, but I point out two things. There's no number four, because you know there's no booting goes on like you would in cereals. And there are no side shoots as there are in, in, in certain vegetables. But basically, we look at leaf development, stem elongation, and we get fluorescence emergence, which you know, some of you would call booting, I think, then flowering, fruit development, ripening, and senescence. Now, there's another system that can be used, and this was published by Harper and Birkenkamp uh, back in 1975, which is kind of easy, and I'll just leave that for you. It sort of goes through seeding, the rosette formation, bud formation, flowering, and ripening. But uh, uh, you know, I put it in here just so you know, I don't mind what terminology people use, uh, but most of the labels now on things like fungicides and herbicides, I find are using the BBCH scale in terms of determining when an application could take place. So let's take a look. We're gonna look through germination, leaf development, stem elongation, as I said, and I'll just use, uh, you know, and then bolting flowering. So this is fairly easy. So you can see that stage six is flowering. So the first flower is 60, 10% is 61, 20% is 62, and so on. So it's just a percentage. The same thing holds through in fruit develop. 10%, 20%, so 73 would tell you it's a 30% bloom. 75 is 50%, or sorry, 50% pod uh, reaching full size. And then when we get into ripening, 80% is seed green. And then seeds dark, seeds dark and hard. It's, it's quite simple, but we'll go through this first and let's look at it. So here we have seed, starts out treated, untreated, whatever, sitting there on the ground. When it imbibes water within about 48 hours at reasonable temperatures, the radical starts developing. It pops out and you can see that the cotyledons start emerging from the seed. No matter which way the seed is setting, it will go down because of uh, it can detect through various mechanisms, gravity, and it will go down. But you can see root hairs are formed very quickly. The cotyledons are exiting. I threw this in just to show you where, it, when you sometimes are trapped into aerial seeding or broadcasting, canola can germinate on the surface very, very quickly, form root hairs and extract nutrients and so on uh, quite quickly. But it, you can also see that as it goes down, the root hairs grow very rapidly. Uh, once the root hairs are, are further down, you start getting lateral roots out here, and these bigger lateral roots up top stay that way for the life of the plant. The root hairs start extracting nutrients from the rhizosphere, or all this soil around the root, uh, lateral root and the root hairs, and that's where the activity takes place with microorganisms that are helping the plant break this down. But the plant only access is two to three percent of the soil because that's the only percentage that actually is supplying nutrients uh, if it's a non-mobile nutrient like perhaps a phosphorus or potassium something like nitrogen which moves by mass flow will flow to the plant but when it gets dry and plants have to extract things like phosphorus and potassium they have to grow to it because it doesn't really move very quickly and here you can see what I talked about, the upper roots stay big, the life of the plant. And you can see here, this is where the mid row band is. The plant can detect that. No problem. You can see that the ladder, the, the tap root does not go down far because it costs energy for a root to go down. And remember, it can't be fed. So when the root has to go down, the shoot has to sacrifice. And in the dry, dry conditions, you'll have a lot of energy going down into the root and you don't get much of a crop because uh, what little is left have to just keep it cool and keep the plant pumping water and growing in to get nutrients. When a root goes down deep, it's going for water because as it goes deeper, 
the pore spaces get tighter, compaction interferes, there's no oxygen for root growth, so it's a real strain on the plant to go deep for water. So uh, I'm a big believer in using uh, moisture probes, and once we understand the amount of water that's available to the plant in the rooting zone, we can make decisions about how to fertilize that plant. Until then, we have trouble. The same time about nutrients, until we start really measuring the nutrients in the stems and in the, in, in the, in the plant, maybe two or three times a year, it's gonna be very difficult to feed this plant adequately without understanding what the plant is short of. And you can see that uh, uh, this is wheat because I don't have a canola one, but you can see that there's the, the, the root and you can see the xylem and phloem, the vascular system plus the tissue around it. And, and this is all that the plant extracts its nutrients from unless it moves in by mass flow. So here's the cotyledon coming up through the ground. And uh, right here, this is the growing point, but the growing point starts way down here before the cotyledons un even unfold. And this is, if this is killed, the plant is dead. Uh, this growing point cannot be redeveloped because the cotyledons are above here, so there's no nutrient left down below. And this is uh, what it looks like once the cotyledons have emerged. And you can see, very typically that it's uh, it's a little lopsided because of the way the leaf will actually form on this side uh, and then this one will move on to form the next leaf because this is a sequence of events uh, the canola plant puts out one leaf at a time and here we are it's basically done so we finished germination now we're on to leaf develop development so the cotyledons are completely unfolded and then we get one leaf 12 is two leaves, 13 is three leaves, and so on. But, you know, if you want to call it three leaf, that's just honky-dory. So here are the cotyledons, boom, boom, boom. And you can see that by the time the cotyledons are out, the actual root is quite substantial in the plant. And this is a little younger, but you can see that this one is quite unfolded, similar to that. So it's got quite a root going already. So as I showed you before on that growing point, this leaf is out first, so we're now at 11 one leaf, because this is a cotyledon. This one isn't fully formed. And by this time, you got a lot of big root. So now this is photosynthesizing. The cotyledons are still supplying nutrients either to the leaf and the roots, and the roots are growing quickly. You can see that here's that leaf that's uh, going into 12, the second leaf that is developing in the lopsided form. And lo and behold, we now have two leaves, so that's 12. And it keeps on going that way until we get up to about six leaves with uh, napus, brassica napus. At that point in time, we start having the bud starting to form. So from a nutrient perspective, you want to fix anything you can in the soil by about the five leaf stage, because at that point in time, the buds are already forming, but they're not doing much. Once those buds start forming, the demand is gonna go up exponentially because besides growing roots, leaves, it is now growing and maturing the seed, the reproductive parts of the plant during that vegetative stage up until the end of flowering. So you wanna tissue test probably at the four leaf stage, maybe early five, and make sure you're up to speed on whatever nutrients you need to apply because that's when you're gonna be having a huge draw on the plant. And we, we, uh, we have, um, uh, of course, you gotta have products that, that fill that. And, and we have uh, one, and I'll just mention this one because it's changed. Uh, our active build, which goes in generally at herbicide time, has now added molybdenum to them because of the acidification that is going on in, in both the seed zone and in many soils across the prairies. Uh, and it's one nutrient uh, that, that only takes a small amount, probably 30, 40 grams per acre is all you need. So you can put it on foliarly, it moves through the plant. Plus, I wanna point out, we, we put zinc and manganese, a little sulfur, we well, no sulfur in this one, but some boron, but a ton of potassium because the plant is now building all those cells and it takes a lot of energy in building all that DNA and genetic material. The manganese and sulfur are involved in in stress management. Then we, we have another, there's another product and, and many companies have, have products that, that are foliar feeds. 
and they're very similar. And, and this one, you can see we don't have, we've got a different uh, uh, spectrum. We have boron in here because boron going into the reproductive stage, uh, the demand is much greater than it is in the vegetative stage. And we supply the full spectrum of nutrients involved in all of the, what are called superoxide desmutase enzymes, which are scavengers of free radicals. Uh, as we call them in human beings. Um, in plants, they're called reactive oxygen species. And if we don't control those free radicals, what happens is they go and break down the lipids in the plasma membrane and the membrane begins to leak. Free radicals or reactive oxygen species are important to the plant and it produces them to deal with stresses, like if it's being attacked by a disease. It will produce free radicals and superoxides, which are toxic to try and kill the invading organism. But if the plant shuts down the stomata because of stresses, that oxygen becomes toxic in the plant. So the plant has to use these to protect it and get rid of those or we start affecting the cells. So that's really the story behind why those nutrients are in that product. So we're carrying on up the Ganges here. Now we have, uh, you can see here, we're at the four going on five leaf stage. And you can see that inside of this little group of leaves, when you look down at these plants, there are two leaves that are covering them. And that's the end of it. Now, stem elongation, I can't even show you a picture of that. Because everybody thinks that stem elongation is bolting. In fact, when the plant has that rosette there, they're, they're just like in wheat, there's, there's elongation takes place. All the nodes are, are already there. So the nodes have to put a little bit of space in between them and start pushing uh, that, that uh, primary bud upwards. And then in the future, there will be actual buds at each one of those nodes where we'll have a small leaf and we'll produce another flower bud. So, so that's only tiny, tiny increments that take place at that point in time. So then we go on to inflorescence emergence. So we get flower buds present, but still enclosed in that leaf I showed you. And then we get them moving out. And let's take a look at that. So here's the bud, the primary bud, and these leaves have, have come apart. Uh, this is, again, showing that, but that is, that is still covered. So uh, there it is open, and we got lots of big, nice leaves. One thing I should tell you guys that maybe are, haven't got a lot of experience, and, and one thing I do, is once you get those big leaves, and even if the plant is growing, always take those leaves and rub them in your hands. A good, healthy leaf will feel like rubber. It'll be pliable, but it'll be thick, and it'll be tough. And to me, that tells you that those plants are doing well. So the bud clusters there, and it starts forming buds. Now we're going to go and show you what happens in the bud. So when you see this bud, no matter how small it is, it's already got the ovules in it. Let's go back to a smaller one. Look at this one. Here's the stigma at the tip here. Here's the pistil, basically, where the ovules are. Here are the anthers, already formed. That's why I said you got to get that plant loaded up because now you've got this primary cluster of buds. And then as the plant grows, you're going to get all those auxiliary buds at every node shooting off. And let's go through this. So here's another one that you can see. I just cut it open and you can see here's the stigma and the anthers. Here's a better shot. There's this, the stigma and pistil. There are the anthers growing. The ovules are already there waiting. Here's a bigger bud. You can see now that the, the actual stigma is well formed. The anthers are starting to yellow and we're gonna to go to yellow bud, but the, the ovules or the seeds are already there. Another shot of it. You can see at this point in time, they're getting bigger, but it's still not pollinated. So the bud cluster starts moving up. keeps getting bigger and moving up. You can see that these smaller uh, actual leaves are, are at each bud and we get side buds starting to form. You can see this bud cluster is starting to move out here. There are bud clusters at each one of these nodes. And 
you can see on this secondary bud cluster here, they start elongating to form a branch. And they start yellowing on that primary bud cluster first, and you start getting separation of those. And on the side bud clusters, you get these on the auxiliary buds. You can see here's one, here's another one. And these, these internodes have not expanded fully. As it continues, you can see that this branch continues to move. And I'll point this out. You see this a lot where we'll get an individual bud that is lost. That could be accidental, could have been a lagus bug, whatever. I don't worry about that. So you got all kinds of bud clusters going, and there can be many of them. Uh, the biggest ones are at the bottom. They get nutrients first. So your biggest pods are usually at the bottom part of whether it's the primary bud cluster or any of the auxiliary bud clusters coming off nodes. Yellowing takes place. That's a nice bud cluster, not monstrous, but it's nice and uniform. You can see it's yellowing. Now, I, I throw this in because you see this sometimes. When you see this kind of loss, that is in Lagus bug, or this kind of loss. It's not a great picture. These aren't my pictures, unfortunately. I'll have to make sure I get some this summer. But that's heat. That's the distress of some kind that took place. Uh, Lagus bug isn't that good. And here's another one showing the same thing. Here are lagus bugs, and you can see that they're on the primary bud cluster, and these are the two leaves right here that enclose that bud cluster when it's small. And a lot of times I'll go out early in the morning, I pull those leaves apart and look inside, and you'll find a, a lagus bug sitting in there. So this is caused, but you can see it's random. Here, here are a few, and here are a few. Uh, these are already starting to open up a bit. And here's a lagus bug actually feeding on a bud cluster that would kill it and it would drop off. Now, for you guys that are really keen, uh, when you look at a bud and you see one of these droplets looks shiny and it's got some droplets of solid in it, that's the feces from a lagus bug. Uh, I noticed that a lot on the pods as well, late in the season, if you get a large number of lagus, you'll see this uh, uh, sitting on the surface of the pod. And you can see that the, the blossoms or the, or the petals are forming in that bud. Uh, I'm sort of going backwards. <clears throat> uh, so, so this is uh, this is showing it later on. You saw them early, the bud clusters early. The anthers are here, and there are the the seeds, and there's the cluster. So that's done. Now it has actually emerged as flower. So now we go to 60, which is flowering. So first flower, 10 percent, 20 percent, 30 percent, so on. Now, here's the other thing that supports what I said earlier. If you take a look at this, this is uh, GS60, the beginning, the first flower. You can see still at this stage, the leaves are, are photosynthesizing a lot, stems not so much, and the pods less. By 50% bloom, stage 65, the leaves are minor part now, it's the stem that is feeding that plant, and the pods are starting to become more prevalent. By the time you get to, to seeds starting to mature in pod formation, that in fact the pods themselves are providing the photosynthetic material and the plant has been pulling the nutrients from the leaves and the leaves are not photosynthesizing much. So let's take a look at how reproduction takes place. And this is a, a, a pollen grain. Uh, there's a plug here that, that sort of uh, keeps things from backing up on it. And there's all this stuff inside the, the uh, the pollen tube and vesicles at the end, uh, just to give you a, a rough idea. So here's what it looks up up close. Uh, and uh, I want to point this out, this, the, the gradation in colors, calcium levels. Everybody talks a whole lot about boron and boron and calcium all together in my nutrient um, webinar. I, I talk about that in the cell wall and this is the same thing in, in a pollen tube or uh, uh, a root hair. They, they're the only two single-celled uh, uh, types of growth in plants, and they both depend on calcium as a signal and calcium to build uh, the, uh, the cells in the root tip. And the plant feeds it from the vacuole back here. And this has to feed through the stigma as it goes because it, it has to take nutrients in through all these transporters in the plasma membrane, as I mentioned earlier on. And here you can see the concentration of calcium in the tip is really, really high, and the pH also changes. So it guides that stigma or uh, root uh, pollen tube through the uh, 
pistol. So let's go back to Bloom. So here's the first one, stage 60. And when we look at this, we can see that the, the, uh, the anthers, there's three anthers, uh, anthers are, are higher than the stigma. And then there's your petals and there's your bracts here. And, and, and you can see on this one, and I'll show you a close up, there's already pollen on the tip of the stigma. But we'll go back a bit. You can see that here the flower is open, but the anthers are low. They're not up even with the tip of the stigma and they're not yellow. There it's taken out the leaves so you can see it. And you can see the stigma is very nice. If you look at the stigma closely, and uh, you can see that it's covered in all kinds of secretions, getting ready for the pollen. The pollen is maturing and turning yellow and is moving up these, uh, the filament is moving them up higher, closer to the tip of the stigma so that the pollen, when it comes out, will be on it. And here you can see the pollen is now rapidly developing and being uh, released and you can see that the now above the stigma and you can see the actual pollen right here on the stigma. Now, uh, you take a look at this shot, you can see that the stigma is covered in all these vesicles as I showed you in that other early shot, but this is the reality. And these are just globules of liquid nutrients that were placed there by the plant. So that when the pollen grain lands, it has to, uh, just like a seed, it has to imbibe secretions in order to pop open the doorway to allow the pollen tube to leave, but it's got to feed as it goes down through the stigma and into the style. This is a shot uh, of the same thing. You can see all this, but here's a, a pollen grain that germinated and you can see the pollen tube because it's pushed the pollen grain up above the surface. So that pollen tube will now grow down and there has to be one of these pollen tubes grow to every seed. Now this you can see, uh, I pulled the, the stigma off and these are all the trails of the pollen tubes moving down from the tick of the stigma down the style and pollinating each individual seed. Once that happens, of course, the anthers disintegrate, the style expands and that's your new pod. This will be lost over time. That's kind of this little beak that sits at the end uh, that was used to transmit the pollen tubes down and that continues to grow becomes the pod. And if you look inside of it, there are all your seeds. Now you can see it's a very messy job because I do this with, with basically a pocket knife in the basement of my house. So I'm not perfect at cutting those those tiny pods open. So uh, that's what takes place. Now, <clears throat> uh, we're gonna move on and we're gonna talk just a tiny bit about sclerotinia. And you know, you folks that are, have been in the field a long time, you know that the pollen, uh, the petals fall into the actuals here, the leaves. And, and if you got a lot of water, uh, that those act as feed for the spores. So I'm not gonna get into when you should spray for sclerotinia because everybody's got different thoughts and you talk to your agronomist or a pathologist. I, uh, I know that uh, when you have a lot of moisture in these actuals and you got petals, uh, it's important. Now, we have new techniques. We have a spornado, which I think is the fabulous thing I've thought for years that we should have spore catching devices in the air to tell us when we have spores there. We have petal testing systems now that I think are very efficient in terms of uh, being able to measure DNA from sclerotinia on the leaves and gives you a good handle on whether you have a risk for treating. You've got variability in terms of the number of side stems you have in terms of, of bloom. Uh, so uh, I'll just go through quickly, and that's just your infection at those actuals, uh, looking at how uh, the plant blooms and getting to that 50% uh, blossom. Now I want to show you this because <clears throat> as I'm shooting these other shots, I come across my friends, the insects. And this is a little thrips feeding on the actual style or on the, the you know the pod while it's still way down there. And you can see this is even pollinated. And there's another one back here. They live in there and they feed on the pollen. So what happens when it feeds? It causes the distortion hormonally and you get these curled pods. You see them in the field all the time. They're not a big deal. That's what causes them. 
So if you want to stage, uh, you know, the, the blooming crop, uh, this comes from the Canola Council of Canada, and, and that's a great resource, by the way, guys. Some of it's a little old, but, you know, there's a lot of good stuff in there. You find the main stem, pull off all the secondary branches, count only the open flowers on the main stem, including the aborted ones, and several uh, samples, several across the field to get you where you're at. So you're looking at, you know, early bloom, you can see that the stigma comes out of that bud and sort of pops its head out. Goes into stage 60, again 60. You get the sides starting to come out. You can see this one's aborted, continuous grow. You're starting to put out more blossoms. Continued blossoming elongation here to separate the actual uh, uh, petioles. Continuing onward with the side branches moving up and blooming just continues to go with all these. So you're gonna whip these all off and you're looking at that as to determine when you're at 50% bloom, more and more blossoms, 10 open flowers on the main stem. That's about 25% bloom. 14 to 16, uh, about that, you're about, uh, I know, 35% bloom, 20 flowers, and anything beyond is about 50% bloom. Uh, I, I can't vouch for any of that kind of stuff. So uh, you, you'll have to figure that out uh, in terms of your spray pattern uh, that you may use in terms of timing. I, I know different people have different opinions. If you're gonna split spray, you wanna, you wanna go at certain points. If you're bone dry, you maybe wanna wait if you got a lot of secondary buds. So there's a lot of stuff involved in decision-making. And then once you get past, you know, when the I usually say we're at 50% bloom or 40% bloom or 25% bloom when probably 25 when it's the yellowish to me. And then after that, it starts going downhill because uh, it's sort of indeterminate. You got the big flowers first and the pods are there. And then the ones at the tip of that primary bud, uh, you know, uh, are pollinated later and come out later. I just show you this, this is uh, Aster Yellows. Again, an oddity you see from time to time, those pods are like bladders on there that's uh, uh, created by leaf hoppers that migrate from the states and bring up a, uh, a mycoplasma that causes that. And we, we did have one big blowout across the prairies back about eight, nine years ago, but that's typically where you'll find uh, anywhere in, in a canola crop in Western Canada. Then we go to a seven and this goes fast. Pods reach full final si reach final size, 30% of pods. 10% of pods reach final size and then to 80%. And then we, this is what you get. I, I point this in here because that bubble tells me that probably a lagus bug punctured there into the seed and it's leaking. Ripening, we get 10% of pods ripe, seed dark, and just continues to 80% and it's fully ripe. So we have the seeds which are fed here after pollination, they're all fed. They have to be fed continuously. So if you have one missing, we'll frequently say, well, that was caused by boron deficiency or maybe lagus had punctured it or whatever, but I don't know if we know that for sure. You start getting mottling in there as it starts maturing and eventually you get them mature. Now, when you get alternaria and whenever you see anything on the outside of the pod, go and look at the seeds and see if they're damaged because this is alternaria on the outside. And if you, you, you look inside, that, that seed has been damaged as well. The seeds start turning uh, black, dark brown, whichever, and getting hard. And eventually it's totally mature. And boom, we got dead, dry plants. Well, that's easy to tell. Pods die shrivel and easy to combine if they don't shrink or if you don't shatter. Well, I'm basically done, but I wanna show you just a couple of things here uh, on, on what my thinking is. Uh, last summer, we had a crop of canola just west of the city of Edmonton here that, that had a phenomenal crop yield uh, at a seed grower. And, and I looked at those plants, I, I got into this late and uh, it was, it was more, somewhat of an accident, but about half of that field was, uh, was broadcast in the fall of 218 with 200 pounds of sulfur plus calcium sulfate. And, uh, when I went and looked at them, uh, I noticed something that was surprising. Number one is where we had applied that, the stems were really thick. The other thing was we had tremendous branching near the bottom of the plant. 
what we didn't, and, uh, and it might be just coincidental, we didn't have that branching. We had very thin stems. And in fact, the roots were just humongous. So it's something I'm gonna be looking for for this year because the size of a stem, I think is related to the yield potential of the plant. Because remember when we were showing the uh, how the amount of nutrient shifted from the leaves to the stems, that's really important in terms of filling and supporting that plant through stress periods. There's a lot of both liquid and nutrient in those stems. So if we can get those big stems out early in roots, uh, I think we got something. But I'll be, that's something I'll be looking for. And you guys that are applying uh, calcium sulfate, uh, sulfur plus, uh, keep an eye out. And lastly, I'm going to just spend a few minutes on club root because of some stuff we've been doing with the University of Alberta here. And this is club root. This is my picture because I don't have it. I, I've seen fields like this. I just never bother taking a picture. And we usually get this at the entrance when we, we put it on the seat or we bring in dirt. Uh, but I want to show you uh, some stuff. And earlier, we, we were testing a concept. And, and I'll run the concept by you first before I show you this uh, pictures. The concept is that club root infects the root hair. It swims. It's attracted to exudates from the plant and infects the root hair. And it goes through a cycle in the root hair. And these zoospores would swim, swim in. They, they get into the root hair, these little tiny ones. That's not a root hair. That's a lot of root, these tiny, tiny root hairs here. And go through a cycle. And then they produce another set of zoospores, which are mobile. And they go and then infect the lateral roots, the root hairs, and the actual uh, main roots. They infect it and start forming these big clubs where they multiply. So you can see here are some early clubs uh, distorting it. And here you can see I, I chopped through uh, one here uh, early on in the early development. And I'll show you what it looks like close up. So here are some, some more as, to, as, as things go on. And you can see that you would think that this is pretty bad. Well, this might be a rating of uh, you know two on a three rating. But in spite of the clubs, it has got more lateral roots and it's got root hair, so it's still getting some nutrient through and it's, and, it's, and it's not too bad. It looks awful, but it's still got root hair, so, so we still get some yield. But when we get to this, this has got no potential to produce anything and those are dying and they die sooner than these here that have some, some root hairs and so on. So here's the, here's the strategy. We know that calcium and boron are key to building cell walls. We also know that we have resistant varieties. Our tests at the University of Alberta in the greenhouse this winter show that at relatively low concentrations, say 100,000 spores was one dosage per gram of soil, we got about a 25% reduction in terms of infection levels and ratings. Uh, our other dosage was 10 million spores per gram and we didn't get any impact at all. So uh, here, here's what we think is we're, we're low, uh, we're, we're, and, and that's in the greenhouse under perfect conditions where we had high moisture all the time for the organisms and so on. So, so the, the concept is if we can increase the calcium and boron levels in the cell walls and make them stronger and resistant by flooding the rooting zone with sulfur and calcium, the sulfur is really good in terms of, of dealing with uh, disease organisms. Can we have a, a yield impact? And secondarily, if we, if we test it against tolerant varieties, resistant varieties, and susceptible varieties, can we uh, help the resistant varieties sustain resistance longer and improve yield by strengthening the cell walls and the roots. So that's the concept we'll be testing in the field this summer. And I'll just show you what, what the inside of a, of, a, uh, of a club looks like. You can see that all these are cells that are going to form millions and billions of, of overwintering spores. And this is what looks like in the earlier stages. And here's what the end result is these big clubs which have billions and billions of spores to go into the soil to give you those massive dosages, this is still not so bad. If we can enhance that through nutrition as well as genetics, integrate the two together with good rotation, 
I think we got a fighting chance to really improve our productivity in this crop and, and over time live with it just like we do with, with other things. Anyhow, that takes us to the end. Uh, hope you have a great season. And uh, here's your bin full of canola. Thanks a lot.